afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. For those that don't know me, I'm Lauren Oakley. I'm the Events Coordinator at Staffordshire Chambers of Commerce. For those of you who haven't used Zoom before, please do not worry. We cannot hear or see you. So if you're eating your lunch, having a drink, or even in your pajamas, please don't worry, we can't see you. You can just see and hear us. A few functions you need to be aware of today. Um, before I introduce Victoria, at the end, Victoria will be kindly taking questions. So you will need to be aware of the Q&A um, box at the top or the bottom of your screen. This can be used to ask questions where Victoria will answer live at the end of the session. There's also a chat function at either the top or bottom of your screen. This can be used if you have any issues throughout the session. Please just pop in the chat and I'll get back to you um, as soon as possible. So I'm delighted today to introduce Victoria Roberts. So Victoria, whenever you're ready, thank you. Uh, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and hello everyone, um, it's great to see you joining us today. Um, so just to introduce myself, so my name is Victoria Roberts, I am the Business Engagement Manager at HS2 and so my role is to work very closely with the HS2 contractors that are already on board but also lo local business organisations such as the Chamber to help raise awareness of the opportunities to local businesses and then help them uh, to understand and navigate our supply chain. So today uh, I'm going to provide an overview of our current activity on HS2 and its progress and then I'm going to give a bit more insight into what this means for opportunities for local businesses, focusing in on that formal supply chain world, and then looking at bidding for work and how you can help your business stand out. So there's a lot of information that I'm going to throw at you today, um, so bear with me, um, and I'll take questions at the end. Um, and, and I understand it's being recorded as well, so we can kind of you can go back and revisit if you do miss anything. So firstly, uh, just a short update on where the project is. Um, so whilst over the past decade, uh, we've been designing the railway, consulting and seeking the powers through Parliament to begin the actual construction. So in April this year, we got what's called notice to proceed uh, for phase one, which is the route between uh, the West Midlands and London, um, to just north of Lichfield. And that means that we're now beginning to construct the actual part of the railway, so the big ticket items, the bridges, the tunnels, laying the tracks. And then for phase 2A, uh, which extends it from the West Midlands to Crewe, uh, the bill is now still progressing through Parliament um, and we expect royal assent uh, by the end of this year, um, early 2021, and that will be giving us the power to then build that next section of the route. So I'd also note in regards to this uh, phase 2A section of the route, so following an independent review that we had at the beginning of the year by Doug Ogilvy um, and the publication of our full business case, uh, we do intend to align the opening of this section, the phase 2A section, with phase 1. And so that's looking to be operational between 2029 and 2023. And so for phase 2A, uh, you will see ground investigation starting um, over the next month and there will be further environmental surveys work taking place as we prepare for that construction work to start. And then the start of the actual work, such as utility diversions, um, environmental and enabling work, will commence about quarter three next year. So that's worth bearing in mind for local opportunities in the supply chain. And then just touch briefly, work, working further north, we've got the phase 2B, which move, uh, moves to Manchester and uh, to Leeds, and that's looking to be completed by 2040. And these are still going through those consultation stages and before the bill can be submitted to Parliament. But I think it's worth noting, uh, before I go on any further, uh, we are working in a really challenging time for businesses, for the project, um, but we're still progressing. Uh, we're working to the strict guidelines to make sure that we can do what needs to happen now and safely within uh, Public Health England guidance. So our contractors are still going out and procuring all the supplies and services they need. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there for businesses and we recognise that's something really important um, during the, the challenging times that our economy is facing now and, and, and in the future as well. So looking at how we build the railway. 
Um, so the work is going to be broken up and it is being broken up into multiple contracts um, and that's across several large construction companies and so there, therefore the opportunities will come through these companies and their subcontractors rather than directly through HS2 Limited themselves. So we set up and regulate the requirements which our contractors then uh, pass down through the supply chain. And then the enabling works which has been going on for, for a few years now has been setting up and clearing the way for our main work uh, construction contractors to get building the railway, uh, you know, the tunnels, the bridges and those sorts of things. And then we've also got our construction contractors for Euston Station and uh, Aldo Common, which is in West London, and they're also on board. Uh, but the two station contractors for the, the West Midlands stations are yet to be awarded, but will be um, in, in the next year. And then when we think about these big contracts, you know, for every big contract that we're awarding, we're expecting thousands of opportunities for businesses and SMEs. And we expect around 400,000 uh, supply chain opportunities just to be created on phase one alone, and around two thirds of these will be for SMEs. So looking a bit uh, closely on uh, where our contractors are, so given where the project is for phase 2A, uh, for businesses who are interested in getting involved in the project now, uh, the opportunities will be with these phase one contractors and their subcontractors um, for, for some of the smaller opportunities as well. So this slide just gives you uh, the information about who they are and where they're working. So we've got Belfort PC Joint Venture and they cover the work between Birmingham and North Warwickshire. Align Joint Venture are delivering the Chilton Tunnel work. Um, EKFB are delivering the main work from Warwickshire to the M25. And SBS Railways are doing the work within the M25. And then the two station contractors are Major Gardas, who are building uh, Euston, and then we've got um, Belfort BC Vinci Sister Java, and they are the old Oak Common station builders. So, but as I mentioned earlier, there will be opportunities arising with the early environmental work and the early civil work contracts that will be awarded, uh, that have been awarded with Belfort BT across 2A in the next year, and that work will be starting later next year. So as an organisation, um, we want to maximise benefits to local businesses. We want the project to bring uh, the businesses based in the communities where we're working into the programme uh, so that they feel the benefits. And we also recognise that local businesses, businesses that are small um, and agile can bring uh, innovation, um, new ideas, greater flexibility uh, to the project, as well as greater cost efficiency, things like improved environmental impact, which are all really important things to us as a business. So they're things that we know that SMEs can bring to us and that will help you stand out um, as part of this uh, bidding process. So we are already using a thousand businesses um, who sit within the communities along the right line of route, which account for about half of our current supply chain. And looking locally to Staffordshire, we've got 75 businesses involved in HS2, and 85% of those, of those are SMEs. So just to give you a bit of flavour, we've got some pictures on the slide. Um, so Stephen on the top right and his team are from Total Reclaimed Demolitions, and they were working to clear one of our the old maintenance depot in Birmingham. And then on the bottom left, um, we've got Kirsty, and she worked for a social enterprise, um, and she was supporting with the demolition work by clearing the waste wood um, and using it uh, within the community uh, to recycle and support uh, vulnerable people back into work. And then we've got, uh, on the bottom right, we've got uh, cleaning printing. Um, so Chris has been working with us for a number of years, and um, printing newsletters, um, maps, uh, any drawings that we require to uh, build a railway, but also inform communities. Um, and then finally, on the top left, we have a company called Trinity Assets. Um, so they're a really good example of a small accommodation business that has seen their business grow um, and the demand grow. Um, and HS2 workers have come in the area. Um, so they've had to take on more um, housing um, in order to compete with that demand. So a really nice story of someone who has kind of grasped the opportunity and run with it there. So thinking about 
um, the different types of supplies and services our contractors and some contractors will need to build the railway, but also to mobilise and manage the construction site and support our workforce. We've got things such as creative services. So these are things like uh, photographers, printers and signage companies. Then we've got food and catering. Uh, so that not only includes kitchen setups and mobile caterers on site, uh, but also catering for meetings and events and places for the workforce to, to get lunch on the local um, high street where they, when they come to the area. And then accommodation could be things like modular blocks on site, uh, but also being a B, private rentals, all the things that we needed for both office and construction staff. And then we've got employee services. Um, so these are the things um, that uh, we need to support the workers. So that could be health and wellbeing things, uh, gyms, dentists, hairdressers, places to spend time with their family. A lot of these workers will be away from home for a number of years um, or a long period of time and be looking to provide um, things to, to do outside of work. And then we've got transport and logistics. So that's anything from uh, private taxi hire, um, on and off transport, uh, logistics planning, uh, traffic management um, for the sites and safety, such as banksmen. And then we've got trade and construction. So trade and construction is not only the materials we need to actually build the railway itself, but also some of the smaller supplies to set up the construction site, manage the construction site. Um, we need electricians, plumbers, those sorts of people as well. And then site services, so that's things like cleaners, uh, facilities management, uh, waste management and disposal, uh, soft landscaping and uh, security services as well. So some of these opportunities will come directly through the uh, tier one contractors, so those big companies I mentioned earlier, but others will come through their subcontractors and so on and so forth. So how, how do you get involved? Um, so with these wide ranging uh, supplies and services that we'll be looking for, uh, there are different ways throughout to get involved. Um, so that could be bidding for a full contract, but also through re uh, regular pe pe uh, purchase orders, sorry, and worker choice. So as a business, you need to think about where you might sit within the supply chain and so approach the route that you might take to get involved. And it will depend on your business. So today I'm going to be concentrating on this uh, contractor space, um, tendering and bidding for work, but I would emphasise that this could be a smaller contract and big contract. So uh, the process is very similar and should be blind for both. Um, but before I get into this, um, I did just want to touch on the purchase order and the worker choice space and what to do um, if you're a business interested in that area. And that is to register your interest with us. So contractors will need uh, regular and ad hoc supplies uh, through purchase orders. So that could be uh, catering, but also videography, specific signage or printing needs. And so making sure that we know about your business is really important here. We go about it in the same way that you would uh, searching for the market yourself. So if we know about your business, we've got you on a list. Um, then when we're looking for something in particular, we can, cut, we can uh, review that list and see if there's a business that is able to um, provide the offer and start that conversation. And then also thinking about the workers, um, mostly um, in phase one out and about at the moment, but as I said, later next year, we will see uh, more and more workers across uh, Staffordshire. And they're going to, again, be looking for places to stay, food, places to go uh, with their family, food to eat. And so making sure that you register using the link on the screen is a way to make sure that these workers uh, know about the offer, they can go out um, and explore the area, and we, we're trying to encourage them to use local, but all obviously that's all caveated at the moment with making sure that they do so safely, um, and, and where it's not safe that they're not going out into communities in the same way they would be otherwise outside of a, a pandemic. So, on that, um, I will now move on to the contractor space, which is what I want to concentrate on today. Um, so before I get um, into the details, I think it's important to note here that contractors will all be buying slightly different ways. Um, so each procurement will depend on the nature, the scope and the scale of the package. Um, some will be more streamlined uh, to what I'm going to go through today. But I think if I give you everything, then the process will, will always be this or less. 
So contractors and subcontractors are all using the platform Compete4. And that's to advertise opportunities. It's an online brokerage platform. And this ensures that there's an open, fair and competitive tendering process. Um, it's completely free to register and bid for opportunities on this platform. So if you do anything today, make sure you, if you haven't done so already, that you sign up to this. Um, it's where you can express your interest in opportunities and respond to opportunities as well. And I will be touching on how uh, to use Compete4 in a bit more detail uh, shortly. Um, but once you have then responded to the opportunity, we move to the next step in this procurement process after you expressing your interest. And that would be stage two, which is the pre-qualification questionnaire uh, and the invitation to tender on the back of that. So with each contractor, again, uh, this comes through uh, Compete4, but then each uh, contractor will potentially use a different procurement portal to run this stage. Uh, but that will all be detailed in uh, the advertisement. And so the purpose of the PQQ, so the pre-qualification questionnaire, is to show your business has the right experience and capabilities. Um, so it's really uh, backward, backward looking, i.e. what you have done in the past. So you might be expected to reference previous projects, such as case studies, to make sure you have all this prepared uh, before you, you start this process. And then the invitation to tender, uh, this is where you're invited to then tender against the scope of the actual requirement. So this is very much forward looking, uh, i.e. your proposals and the approach to this specific job. And so it's designed to test your approach in meeting the specifications and the requirements that are outlined in that contract. And the evaluation is likely to be a combination of technical quality and commercials. Um, but it's also really important to demonstrate how you're going to support the delivery of the HS2 wider goals. Uh, so some of the things around skills, education and employment, uh, sustainability. And these are some of the things that I will touch on as well later today. But the key here is to focus on where you can add value uh, to the project as a potential supplier. Um, and we do recognise that this whole process can be quite um, time consuming, especially for smaller businesses and SMEs. So we have taken steps to uh, reduce this burden. We streamlined the pre-qualification process uh, to use a common set of industry agreed questions. And if you are a smaller company, uh, the it's all proportioned, so you don't have to go through the same level uh, that you would if you were applying for a bigger contract as a bigger company as well. So moving on to the last stage, uh, stage three. Um, so this is where you're successful as being a preferred bidder. And so during this time, uh, this is where there's potential scope for final negotiation. And it's really important uh, to make sure that you're happy with any contract. And then once that contract's been awarded um, and the order placed, there's a mobilization period as you begin your work. And then depending on how the contract is administered, uh, there's a regular review and feedback that will take place. Uh, but it's really important to stress that this should be two ways. Uh, so it's your performance, but also the performance of, of your uh, client. Um, as a project, we want to make sure uh, that smaller and um, more businesses in the supply chain feel empowered to speak up when something isn't right or could be improved um, in order to make sure that we're delivering everything in the best way uh, possible. So now I've gone through uh, a quick overview of the actual um, kind of steps and stages of that procurement. I'm now going to talk a little bit more around the platform Compete4. Um, it's a really great platform um, and I just want to give a few tips to make sure that you can get the most out of this platform. So there is no minimum value for the contract to be advertised on Compete4, and HS2 mandates that um, contractors advertise and use this platform to make sure that everybody gets a chance to, to look and see the opportunities. Uh, there are a few exceptions to this, um, but that's normally due to time, cost, uh, uh, critical circumstances for contractors, but all of those have to be approved and justified through HS2 before it doesn't go out to market. So if you're looking to get uh, registered on Compete4, the step is registering, uh, really simple details, uh, just kind of the name, address, the size of your business, uh, turnover. It takes a few minutes to register. And then the next step is setting up your business profile. And so this normally takes around 30 minutes, um, but the more information you fill in, uh, the more you get out of the 
system, and the more um, the easier it is to uh, express an interest in an opportunity as it pulls through the information automatically for you. Um, so it's a really it's a useful work, um, it's a useful thing to do ahead of time. And then I also wanted to highlight the marketing tab as you're filling out your profile in particular. Um, so this is uh, where additional users will be able to see more about your business. Um, so Compete Board is a great platform uh, to um, use to identify potential partners, maybe if you're looking to bid jointly on a particular opportunity. Um, it's a way that you can potentially find someone to do that with. Uh, but it's also a great way that other businesses can find you uh, to do the same or to find businesses um, that are looking for a particular supplier and they, they see that it could be something that you would be interested in, they can then get in touch. So it's worth putting that a bit of time into that as a way to promote and advertise your business. And then the next step um, is around um, making sure that you um, get your alerts. So um, as a system, once you set the alert, you, they get, you get push notifications through to your email, so you don't have to check you know, every second of the day. But it's really important that you tailor these um, to your business um, to make sure that you're not getting, you know, bombarded with opportunities that aren't really uh, related to you. Um, so it's worth taking the time to, to think about uh, the key services that you're looking for, the regions where you're looking for. You can set it for particular organisations, uh, particular supplies, um, particular categories of work. Um, so tailoring that, and you can tweak it as you go as well as you find the types of things that you're getting through. And then the next um, step is around your supplier search. So we want to make sure that uh, you you know how to not miss opportunities um, and not you know rely fully on the alerts um, because we know that you know sometimes if you haven't set them in the right way, you might miss an opportunity. Um, so the way you can do that is uh, to um, search the tracked and matched opportunities, which are on the left-hand side. Um, so here you can see the tracked ones are ones that are picked up as a result of your alert, so they've been matched to you. Oh, sorry, that's the matched ones. And then the tracked ones are ones where you have said, this is something I'm interested in, I want to see what happens with this opportunity. And so there you can see um, where, at what stage it's at, and you can also see um, who wins that contract if it's not yourself. And so it's a really good way to track um, contracts where it might not be something you would bid for directly, but it could be that you would work with whoever wins that, because you can then see who wins it, see their details, and, and get in touch with them directly um, to see if there's an opportunity for you with that organisation. So that's another really good way to make sure that you're seeing uh, who the subcontractors are that are coming on board um, nice and early and can kind of get your foot in the door and understand what it is that they're looking for and if there's going to be opportunities coming uh, down the supply chain and what, when and what they might be. So in terms of responding, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the buyers will create a shortlist of suppliers from the uh, PQQ questionnaire and the invitation to tender. Um, so that's kind of where this then state finishes um, on the platform. So hopefully that provided you with a whistle stop uh, tour and a bit of insight into how to use the platform. But I'm now going to touch on uh, some of the values that I mentioned are really important within this process to demonstrate. Um, in particular, I just want to, to focus on uh, things like the health and safety values that we've got, um, community commitments, which is our being a good neighbour, then we've got sustainability and environment, and then we've also got skills, education um, and employment, and equality, diversity and inclusion. And all these things are um, weighted within contracts, uh, depending on the type and scale of your contract. So they're really important things to think about um, and get ready uh, before you, you go and start bidding for any work with HS2 or our supply chain. So health and safety, um, obviously this is one of our number one priorities as a project and it's particularly something that we want to raise the bar on across the industry. So we're not looking to just reach the standards, we're looking for our supply chain to help us raise the standards. Um, and the assessment is normally a, a risk based, um, so it will have specific questions or criteria um, which you will have to demonstrate. Um, 
and the type this will these will depend on again on the type of work uh, that you undertake or the service that you're looking to provide so there is a dedicated health and safety approach document uh, it's publicly available and the link is on the slide um, and this provides a lot more detail and I would completely recommend that you have a look through this uh, before you then go on to um, submit any applications and it provides you with that clarity of what our expectations are and requirements are around health and safety and within that document you'll see that there are seven focus areas for our supply chain um, so we've got uh, worker safety, uh, public and neighbourhood um, health and safety, workforce occupational health and wellbeing, um, health uh, safety by design, safe procurement, safe operations and smart assurance. So these are areas which we've identified as a, re as a risk, but also where we can see that there are opportunities to make a difference to improve um, standards and leave that legacy of improved health and safety within the industry. So think about where your business can help in some of these focus areas and really focus in on that when you're, you're um, filling out your uh, tender. Um, and then community commitments. Um, so this focuses on our strategic objective to be a good neighbour. So it's about building the railway with respect um, and empathy for the communities that are disrupted as a result of HS2 and its construction. Um, to us, how, um, how we behave um, is as important to us um, as a success um, as the engineering in terms of the project success. Um, so we have a community engagement strategy. Um, so it's a key document which sets out our 10 commitments to communities. It's basically a blueprint to how we work. So it's really um, important to familiar rise yourself with some of these commitments as we're looking to our supply chain again the people who are out in these communities to help us deliver on these commitments um, and again it's available online with the link on the slide and i'm just going to highlight a couple of the ones which are particularly important to businesses and potential suppliers um, so that's uh, the first one is our commitment three um, and this is about making sure that we're telling uh, people what's happening, where we're working, when we're working. Um, so there's a number of channels we do this through. Um, obviously, a lot of face-to-face -face activity is postponed at the moment. So we're relying on a, our community website and social media, um, as well as things like webinars to make sure that communities uh, remain informed. Uh, but it's important that we work very closely with the contractors and also their supply chain to get that forward look, to make sure that we're sharing accurate information and that communities who, who uh, want to know what's going on have that full picture of who's working in their area and doing what. And then we look at uh, our fourth commitment, which is around our um, 24 hours um, helpline. Um, so this is um, available all day, every day, all night, um, and it's where we can listen and answer the concerns of communities. Um, so if you're approached with questions um, from a community member when you're out and about on the project, it's really important that you're aware of the helpline so you can direct people uh, to this um, to get any answers to questions that they might need. Uh, but also there might be cases where if we're unable to answer the query um, at first point of call, we might be needing to go into the supply chain to find out uh, what was happening, uh, what they're concerned about. So as a business, it might be that you are contacted in relation to any inquiries um, on that. And then moving to commitment seven, um, this is about leaving that legacy within uh, communities, so bringing benefits to uh, the areas where we're working and giving something back. Um, so as well as benefits of job opportunities and business opportunities, when looking at this from um, a perspective of a potential supplier, it's looking about it's about highlighting your involvement in bringing benefits to the community so it could be do you do any work for local charities um, do you use some of your profits to invest in the community in some way um, is there a way that you could work or you are going to work differently that would help the community um, uh, whether it's reducing the impact uh, the disruption or or looking at ways that you can give something back as part of your work. So that's a really good way to help your business stand out on that point. And then the last commitment I was just going to touch on was um, complaints that we may receive. And again, we have a dedicated team to that. So it's just being aware that if we do have complaints, that sometimes we do need to get to the bottom of what's happened. And that might mean getting in touch um, 
through our contractors to the subcontractors that might be out on site um, so that we can understand what's happened and see if there's something we can do to resolve any issues that might have arisen such as you know noise and um, traffic and that sort of thing. And then looking at the environment, um, so we obviously um, are aware that there are impacts of this project, so we look at ways that we can reduce that as much as possible. And looking at our supply chain for innovations is a key part in that. Um, so this includes things such as noise, um, pollution, protecting our heritage, uh, reducing resource use, uh, protecting, enhancing and creating habitats, and also lowering our carbon footprint. So where are we looking to our supply chain to add value and help in this space? So it's about showing us new opportunities and innovations that can help towards some of these areas. So if there's something you do as a business that um, means that you're using more recycled materials, uh, you are able to contribute to um, the circular economy, looking for solutions that are efficient to build and fully replaceable, um, looking for non-primary use of materials, is there a way that you can reduce your carbon footprint? Um, so for example, in London, uh, we've begun using a new low carbon concrete, uh, which provides a reduction of 42% in CO2 in comparison to uh, standard concrete. So anything that sets your business out as showing that you are helping contribute to one of those areas is really important to us. And it's also something that will really help you through the process. And then the next area, is uh, employment and education. Um, so we have a strategy that sets out four key objectives. Uh, so the first and foremost is the need to assure that we have the people and the skills to build this railway. Um, and this objective is obviously very crucial and continue and will continue to be. And then the second objective um, is that the vast majority of direct opportunities are created through the supply chain. And so focusing our drive on our suppliers to create and deliver these opportunities is really important to us. And this is where you come in. And then objective three is around inspiring the next generation. And um, so a child starting primary school this year could be an apprentice on the phase 2B section of the route in the 2030s. And then the last of the objectives overlays all of the other objectives to ensure that we maximise the benefit of the HS2 project. So what do we actually ask of the supply chain in this space of skills, employment, education? So contractors choose from a menu of activities set out in our contract. Um, so it's expected that the requirements that we set are direct contractors will then filter down through the supply chain. So you can expect to be asked during the procurement process what your previous experience has been in these areas and for one or more of these areas to be a requirement in your contract. Um, so think about what you, your business, your employees may already do in this space. So have you run a stand at a local career show, uh, presented at a school assembly, or had students do for work um, experience or, or you're getting apprentices on board. And then each activity um, on this page is, is weighted and the expectations, again, uh, as with all of these things I'm talking about, is reflected in the scale and the size of the contract. So there's a wide range of things for your business to look at in this space, depending on where you've got the resource um, to do so. And then look, the last value I wanted to look at uh, was our commitment around diversifying our supply chain. Um, so there will be a skill shortage um, unless we use um, innovative ways to ensure that we track and tap into the diverse talent that we have. Um, so we set um, equality, diversity, inclusion, EDI requirements um, in the following six areas within our contract. So we've got EDI policy, recruitment, workforce monitoring, um, EDI training, uh, supply chain diversity, and EDI external verified standards. But that last one tends to be with the larger contracts. And the challenge of our kind of direct suppliers um, has had to deliver on these will be again cascaded through the supply chain and as always it will be managed in accordance to the um, ability and size of the businesses that we're looking for. So if you are a business of 50 employees we don't expect you to have extensive procedures and policies in place but we expect you to have something that looks into and recognises the importance and the change that we're looking for in these areas. So 
looking at what you can do as a business, uh, the first thing is make sure that you collect and report on diversity data. And um, that gives us a transparent view of diversity on your company and where gaps may be, but it's also a great way for you to then demonstrate any improvements in this space as well. Um, so challenge as well your, your contractors and um, the people that you're working for um, on new ways of looking to improve this. You know, they don't necessarily know it all. Uh, they don't live the lives and experiences that you have lived um, as, as small businesses and SMEs. So it's important that you bring your ideas to the table and there should be that, again, that two-way uh, communication to allow that to happen. And then think about how you can show practical commitment to uh, EDI outcomes. Um, so, for example, it could be flexible working, um, new workplace adjust adjustments, and then establishing it as a continuous improvement. So it's not just a tick box, looking at where you are, benchmarking yourself, and showing the steps that you're making to improve. We don't expect everyone uh, to be at the top where at the start, but what we want to see is that um, that progression and that need and drive for change. Um, so it could be um, internal staff training, uh, new approaches to recruitment uh, to help reach out to new people and new communities as well. So now I know I've gone through a lot of uh, information there uh, very quickly. Um, so I just wanted to flag that there is a lot of support out there for businesses in developing in these areas. Um, so there's work, you know, our contractors are there to help and advise. Uh, there's also obviously the support um, that you can get from uh, local business organisations such as uh, the Chamber. And then we also have um, work with the Supply Chain Sustainability School that I just wanted to highlight here. Um, it's completely free. Um, it gives you access to free e-learning modules and training workshops, um, self-assessments and action plans, uh, benchmarking tools, uh, networking opportunities, and uh, thousands of other online resources. And um, this is really uh, useful because using this platform, you can then gain recognized certifications um, and get help in creating some of the policies that I've talked about that you might need, such as um, NEDI policy, um, sustainability, um, health and safety. So it's things that we recognize as, as something that you're doing and it's something that you can showcase as having gone through um, as part of your procurement. And then so before I finish, I just wanted to round up on some of uh, my top tips when looking to bid for work. So first and foremost, make sure you register with Compete4, um, allocate the responsibility for searching through opportunities with someone in addition to making sure you've tailored your alerts. Um, so 10 minutes, once a week, uh, twice a week, um, it doesn't have to be a huge uh, resource. And then when, when these opportunities arise, make sure you take immediate action, you get, get everybody together, you think about what you need to do and you start that project plan. And then understand our visions, values and strategic goals of the project. Uh, remember these aren't a tick box, the things that we recognise throughout the process, so the things that I've spoken about today. So making sure that you have the policies in place um, to start this, you know, the health and safety, the EGI, um, qualities and they don't have to be onerous um, it can be a one pager um, and again use the support services the supply chain sustainability school to help you with this and then weigh up your decision to bid uh, make sure you fully understand the risk requirements and that you've uh, looked carefully at the evaluation criteria can you meet these requirements is there things that you need to go and do uh, to make sure that you do meet these requirements or is it an opportunity here to potentially consider partnering with another supplier to put in a stronger bid if appropriate? So, you know, think about cooperating rather than competing. And then look at building your network. So attend events, forums, uh, build relationships with your peers and other businesses, uh, consider social media, um, but all interactions, interactions should have that clear purpose, uh, laser sharp focus, so have a clear Proposition and output are uh, to every interaction. And then the key, be ready and don't be modest, shout about your achievements. And then last but not least, um, we've got uh, our questions. If you're not sure, make sure you get questions in early and you can do this through the actual procurement per portal for that opportunity. Um, and make sure that you understand exactly what it is that you need to do and the format uh, that you need to do it in so that you've got the right word limit, you've got the right attachments, the right references that are needed through that process. Make sure you've got a clear plan. Um, as I said at the start, um, you 
take immediate action, get everybody in the room and sort out the timeframes and what you need uh, for when internally to make sure that you don't miss that deadline or you don't have that last minute rush uh, to get everything together. And something that's really important is evidencing your capabilities um, and being able to measure that progress. So don't make hollow statements or assertions about evidence. This is really important. You've got to back up what you're saying uh, when you're shouting about your business. And then when referencing policies, uh, don't just consider them as inputs. So consider them as outputs. So what did the policy enable you to achieve? So can you demonstrate a change in performance as a result of that policy? Uh, for example, if you implemented an EDI policy, did you uh, see an improvement in uh, the diversity of your workforce? Um, they're, they're the types of things that we're looking for. We don't just want to know that you've got one. We want to know what that means for your business. And then consider case studies. So what went well? What could be improved? Um, don't give all the positives. Uh, we want to see that you are demonstrating that you've got lessons learned and that you've implemented on the back of those lessons as well. And then it sounds simple, uh, but you'd be amazed how many people don't. Uh, but make sure you answer the question being asked. Um, consider any weightings related to that question. Uh, avoid copying and pasting um, and make sure you're paying attention to the word limits and other formatting requirements that there might be. And then when you're writing your responses, you use plain English, uh, make sure the answers are succinct, straight to the point, easy to read, uh, don't use jargon, and um, think about how you could break it up, whether you're using subheadings or headings or bullet points. And then, you know, if you're not successful in that first round, make sure you do ask for feedback from the buyer, understand how you can, can um, how you can improve and have a lessons learned meeting. Uh, make sure you've saved everything that you've used in the previous one so you can bring that in uh, if, when the next opportunity might arise. And, you know, if you don't succeed, try um, try again. There'll be lots of opportunities over the years. And then make sure you do use that support services that are available. There's a lot of great stuff out there. There's a lot of great organisations that can help. Um, and we want to make sure that we're supporting businesses to upskill and develop as part of this programme and then to get the opportunities uh, and benefit from being involved. And so on that note, um, I'm going to uh, finish and I'll hand back. Thank you, yeah. Victoria. Thank you for such a really, really informative, great presentation with such useful in-depth information there. A lot was covered. Um, I know I've just had somebody asking if these slides will be shared. So Victoria, if you don't mind, if you could send me them over and then I can share with um, everybody that's attended today, if, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I can share the slides and as well the key kind of links to documents and things that I mentioned today as well. That's great. Thank you very much. So like Victoria said, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to put this in the Q&A, either at the top or bottom of your screen. Um, we have got um, a few minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions. Thank you. You might have answered everybody's questions already, Victoria. We'll just give it a few know, minutes, though, yeah. so just in case. <laughs> I know there was some, um, I, I went through a lot of information, um, so um, I appreciate that was a lot to take in. Uh, so it's something that there's a lot of uh, takeaways to go away, have a look at some of the resources that I mentioned. And again, if that brings up questions, um, people have got any more uh, concerns about how they can get involved, uh, the types of opportunities, then we're, help to, we're here to help answer those questions. So um, either come to you guys straight through the chamber and we can uh, work together or, or contact teachers too directly. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. I can see that Declan's popped up his hand. Declan, if you have got any questions, if you want to pop them in the Q&A um, whilst Victoria's here and she can answer them live. Oh, here we go. I'll just say, um, just allowing to Declan talk. Hi, Declan, can you hear us? You just want to unmute your mic, Declan. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, it was just a quick point, really. Um,
couple of things. First of all, thanks, Victoria, for giving us a very informative presentation this afternoon. I just wanted to mention that uh, as Staffordshire Chambers of Commerce, we've developed a new HS2 forum, which is very much there to make sure that as the Chamber of Commerce in Staffordshire, we, we're speaking on behalf of our members. And from a HS2 point of view, we want to get the very most in terms of economic and social benefits from the, the build and arrival of HS2. Uh, we also want to... Um, do something you mentioned earlier Victoria in terms of that skills legacy we want to make sure that those who are leaving colleges universities in the years to come have got the skills to be able to fill the roles that will come out through uh, HS2 so I just want to mention our HS2 forum it meets up several times a year the next meeting is on the 6th of November so if any uh, anyone here today would be interested in joining the HS2 forum it's a great chance to join the conversation and make sure that Staffordshire does get the most out of the arrival and build of HS2. So um, feel free to get in touch with me or Lauren, anyone at the Chamber, we'd be happy to let you have further details on that. Thank you. Thank you, Declan. I've just had um, Caroline said, Victoria, thank you for today. I work for an apprenticeship training provider who can support the project with work experience apprentices. Can you confirm who we can send some further information to regarding how we can support the supply chain to deliver the objectives? Um, so I think there's a number of channels uh, you could do that through, but I think uh, it would be best if you send that through uh, directly to me. I'm happy to share my contact details and then I can pass that on to, um, we have a skills employment and education team within HS2 and they work very closely with all the, the counterparts within the supply chain, which I think would be where your opportunity to get involved would be, would be with those contractors and subcontractors as well. Um, so yes, I'm happy to share my details um, and get those passed on to you so you can share any information. Great, thank you Victoria. Caroline says fantastic, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody who attended today's webinar. Thank you for taking the time to come and join us. I'd also like to say a massive thank you for Victoria for again sharing such knowledge with us and um, educating us over this last um, hour. For anybody that would like to watch this presentation um, and webinar again, this can be found on our webinar library on the Chamber website. Now I do hope you all take care and hopefully we'll see you all very soon. Thank you very much everybody, goodbye. Thank you.